Um, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, I'm really glad to follow the previous panel, um, and perhaps especially Jessica's paper, um, which uh, has set uh, a nice context uh, of what it meant to the Greeks uh, to eat people. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the, um, the meaning of uh, eating people uh, and the ways in which uh, it's used in a particular uh, literary context. So I'm taking you to Plato's werewolf analogy in The Republic, which uh, first occurs uh, at the point um, that uh, I've put on the handout, 565D to E. What then is the starting point of the transformation of a protector into a tyrant? Is it not obviously when the protector begins to do the same things as those in the story that is told of the shrine of Lucaeum's use in Arcadia? The story that he goes, that he who tastes of the one bit of human entrails minced up with those of other victims, is inevitably transformed into a wolf. Have you not heard the account? <coughs> I have. <laughs> okay, so this dialogue focuses on two key themes. The role of justice in individual happiness and the nature of the ideal state and its institutions. And this werewolf myth analogy occurs at the end of a substantial discussion describing the development of democracy and oligarchy and the way in which a democratic context gives rise to a tyrant. The nature and role of appetites and desires are, of course, crucial in this process. Some are necessary, others are unnecessary. The latter do our souls harm, while the others do us good. The appearance of the wolf comes as something of a shock, since the analogy used up to this point employs bees and their concern with the division of honey. The tyrant emerges when those who have money defend themselves against the plundering drones, are accused of revolutionary plotting, and through no fault of their own, then become oligarchs. The people then, in response, put forward a protector, and this is the character who runs the risk of becoming a tyrant, and about whom this werewolf analogy is then used. Now, earlier in the conversation, Socrates has introduced the parallel of the guard dog as a comparison for his city's guardians, and the werewolf analogy used here recalls this theme, but offers the quite the opposite set of qualities. So this contrast swiftly encapsulates everything that's wrong with the psychology and behaviour of the tyrant. So the horror of the werewolf image is an important introduction to Plato's depiction of the tyrant, who's described elsewhere as being fundamentally quite a distressed individual, his soul dominated by a part that has no conception of what's best for the whole, a microcosm of the tyrant's role in the city. In fact, the image of a man corrupted by his consumption of human flesh, overtaken by an animal's ruthless and inhuman characteristics, works to reinforce what is, on closer examination, a rather feeble argument. As Julia Annas has succinctly put it, Plato's tyrant wouldn't last a week. But in fact, the use of the image of the werewolf has its own problems, if we take it as is common, as evidence for rites conducted by worshippers of Zeus on Mount Nicaean in Arcadia. So thinking about it as evidence for an actual ritual... Richard Buxton's observed, Plato speaks of a rite in which human innards are mixed with parts of other animals and the person who tastes the human must turn into a wolf. This in turn is taken as describing the same ritual whose purported elements Pausanias reports, and I've given you that quote on the handout at number two. They say that ever since the time of Lucaon, a man was always turned into a wolf at the sacrifice to Lucaon's use, but not for his whole life because if he kept off the human flesh when he was a wolf, he turned back into a man after nine years, whereas if he tasted human flesh, he stayed a wild beast forever. However, we have to bear in mind what's rarely mentioned about that quote, which is that Pausanias is describing what people say about Lucaon as an example of a story that's been elaborated to the point of being quite unbelievable. Indeed, he actually prefaces his description with this warning, all through the ages, many events that have occurred in the past, and even some that occur today, have been generally discredited because of the lies built up on a foundation of fact. So these passages, along with brief mentions in other sources, suggest that stories about Mount Lucaon and the rituals there 
was, that were circulating in their classical and Hellenistic periods. But scholars have taken it to indicate that cannibalistic rituals were actually conducted on Mount Nucaeum, and we'll return to this below. Uh, a little bit more about the kinds of ritual that are associated with this. Um, whatever seems to have happened up there on that mountain seems to have involved temporary exclusion from the community. And we get modern scholarship making a link with other rituals described by Pliny the Elder and St. Augustine, uh, which involve a member of the family of Anthos, one of the local families, chosen by Lot, leaving his clothes on an oak tree, swimming across a pool, going away into a deserted area and turning into a wolf. If he doesn't consume human meat for nine years, he's then permitted to come back, again the same way, swimming across the pool and then reclaiming his clothes. In Augustine, the family of Anthos has become the Arcadians in general, and Walter Burkett has seen this as reflecting an original <coughs> ritual initiation for the Ephebes, the young men, the 18-year-olds of the Arcadians, which in the end came to be practiced by only a single family, um, as a result of the civilizing effect of the foundation of the great city in Arcadia, Megalopolis. Others have suggested that these are, in fact, different rituals taking place in different places. But wherever the rituals, plural, singular, were thought to have taken place, they each and all seem to have offered the individual, in the role of the werewolf, a chance of redemption. Whereas, in contrast, the tyrant of Plato's description is given no such opportunity. So Plato recounts the gradual, apparently unstoppable development of this man's crimes. Not even the pleas of his own parents can stop the, wolf, the tyrant in training. The parallel of the werewolf of Mount Lucaon, despite offering powerful imagery, is flawed. It doesn't actually offer a useful analogy in this context. So the purpose of this paper isn't to probe Plato's views on tyranny, and nor is it to work out what may really have happened in that ritual. Sorry, Rather, the question at issue is why and how Plato uses the imagery of the werewolf from Arcadia if the reference to the ritual doesn't really work as an analogy for his argument, and indeed can actually be misleading. So instead, I want to suggest that Plato's analogy is not meant to direct his audience to the actualities of a ritual, but first to the myth that underpins it and its implications for approaches to leadership, and second in that context to what at the time were recent real-world events and a particular political leader. So if we think about the myth and their meanings, or the myths and their meanings, Lucaon was, as Richard Buxton's dubbed him, a bringer of culture as well as a criminal. But we can go further than that. So in our earlier source, attributable to Hesiod, Lucaon appears as a central figure in the genealogy, peopling, and civilization of Arcadia. His father is Pelasgos. In Arcadian myth, Pelasgos is the first inhabitant of Arcadia, and he's autochthonous. He's deeply rooted to the land. Lucaon has sons that provide the names of key settlements across Arcadia. So Apollodorus says he produced 50 sons, Dionysius of Halicarnassus gives 22. And he, in turn, is grandfather of Arcas, perhaps the son of Zeus, who will invent agriculture, bread-making, and weaving. And I've given all the references in there at number four on the handout. Now, Lucaon's downfall comes when he sacrifices a human baby. He pours its blood upon the altar to Zeus, and he is immediately turned into a wolf. The accounts of this event, however, vary. In one fragment of the catalogue, Lucaon serves the child in order to get his revenge on Zeus, who's impregnated his daughter, common event. Some versions put the blame on Lucaon, others put it on his sons. In Apollodorus, Zeus is testing the impiety of these young men and arrives disguised as a day labourer. Uh, in other sources, the sons are testing the identity of their visitor. Is he really a god? The identity of the person sacrificed varies as well. Some keep it in the family. The Hesiodic fragments describe it as Arcos, Lucaon's grandson, and later sources say it's Lucaon's son, Nuctimos. Apollodorus says he offers a local child. Other sources leave it undescribed, even just saying human flesh. Servius gives us a guest who's come to visit, and the story becomes a warning fable about violating the laws of hospitality, some violation. Ovid says it's a Molossian hostage. 
Some scholars have also seen here evidence to support the reality of a cannibalistic ritual. So Madeleine Jost observes that the story of the banquet in a number of accounts recalls through the vocabulary an actual sacrifice. But I think to read the myth as offering evidence of actual cannibalism is to overlook or attempt to actualise what are symbolic themes. Themes which, if anything, emphasise the wrongness of such a ritual and give no reason to suppose that the Greeks should continue with such an act. So the story as presented in the myth is replete with the idea of punishment. It comes in a variety of configurations across the sources. So different accounts describe the destruction of Lucan's house and all his children. Sometimes Lucan's a wolf, sometimes his children are wolves. Lucan's house is destroyed by a thunderbolt and he's turned into a wolf. But sometimes the sons are blasted while Lucan becomes a wolf. And sometimes some sons are blasted while others become wolves. Sometimes no wolf metamorphosis is mentioned at all. And instead both father and sons are blasted with thunderbolt or just the father. In Ovid, famously, the whole event is followed by a flood that wipes out the entire human race, except for Pyrrha and Deucalion. And Apollodorus seems to think there was a flood as well, but that's not clear. The same aspect seems to be the focus of the iconography of Zeus Lucaeus, which comprises many images of Zeus, always holding a thunderbolt. And although this also has references to him as a weather god, um, the connection to, his, to this myth is also uh, part of that iconography, and literary references to him make the same connection. So overall, the message of all these different versions of the story is that human sacrifice or cannibalism is wrong. The tale of Lucaeon offers a reflection on what it is to be civilised. Buxton argues that the myth leads us to reflect on the importance of maintaining proper relationships with the gods. The story, as told by Pausanias, marks cosmological change, and it does it with a suitably shocking event. So where once the gods sat at table with humans, now they no longer do so. Mortals transcend their earlier somewhat primitive but more idyllic existence, and they come to inhabit the everyday world of those telling the myth. More specifically, alongside the theme of the justice of Zeus, this narrative raises questions about the nat nature of mortal political leadership, emphasising how a leader has to face the consequences of his choices. So the image of a wolf is perhaps particularly important in that context. In a number of ancient sources, the wolf is known not only as a savage killer, but also as a spontaneously political animal who shares out its kill equally among the members of its community. And in the context of this narrative, the use of this specific animal metamorphosis as punishment has particular resonance. Hasn't Lucan shared out the sacrifice appropriately? What would that mean if you're killing a human child? There is in this analogy a commentary on what it means to be human rather than animal, what it is to perform a sacrifice rather than just to share a kill. Now, such an expansion of the interpretation of the significance and association of Plato's analogy clarifies his use of it in the context of the irredeemable character of the tyrant, bringing to light the myths, themes of civilization, leadership, and responsibility. However, although it offers a rich set of references, the question of why Plato may have selected this particular myth of cannibalism <coughs> to make his point here remains to be explored. Uh, and just this last part of the paper, I just want to raise some possibilities of why that seemed appropriate to him. So scholarship has dated the composition of the Republic between 380 to 360, nice and wide. This paper suggests that Plato's use of this particular analogy, which draws on a well-known story from Arcadia, was intended to prompt reflection on an actual political situation after 371 BC and the political and military entanglements that are occurring between the great powers, so Arcadia, Sparta, Athens, Thebes, during the 360s. So there are a number of possible contemporary resonances. First, it may reflect on Athens' relationship with Sparta. So after the Battle of Leuctra, Athens has allied with the Thebans, but a movement in support of an Arcadian federation has emerged. It turns to Athens and it asks for support. And when Athens refuses, it turns to Thebes. So the Spartans, who are now facing an invading force of Thebans, also ask Athens for help. Gotta love it. 
and the Athenians vote to support them too. So these are the Athenians now turning back to their mortal enemies, the Spartans, and it's a major change of policy for them. Can Plato's reflection on the wolf that has tasted human flesh therefore be taken as a warning to the Athenians about the dangers of their renewed relationship with Sparta? Certainly there are those at the time who ask questions about this choice of alliance. But actually, in fact, Plato, uh, biographical details about him suggest he supports the alliance. And we know that he was connected to those who actually proposed and were uh, active in, in making it happen. So in that case, perhaps it's Thebes that provides this fit for the analogy. Perhaps especially reflecting the tyrant's change from protector to aggressor. So we have evidence for the widespread perception that Thebes' behaviour towards its own allies was seen as actually tyrannical. So the Theban destruction of Plataea in 373 BC, about which the Athenians had very strong feelings, is one example. So it may reflect perceptions also about Theban behaviour towards its other allies, uh, including the Arcadians themselves. Perhaps during the foundation of Megalopolis, in which the Thebans were traditionally meant to have been involved, um, and which some Arcadian communities had to be coerced to join. Perhaps it's during later events as the alliance between them fell apart. Indeed, Pausanias relates a story that actually associates the great Theban leader, Epaminondas, and the Thebans with the imagery of the wolf before the Battle of Leptra. So some aspects of the Theban parallel seem cogent, and yet Plato's analogy focuses the reader's attention completely on Arcadia. And this leads to my final suggestion for the potential target of this analogy, and that's that it was the Arcadian politician Lycomedes. So, as mentioned, Theban-Arcadian alliances fell apart in 366, and the result had immediate implications for Athens when the Arcadians sought an alliance with their city. So the Arcadian politician who helped to set up both alliances was Lycomedes, and that means the wolf sly. It's a name that encompassed not only the aggression of the wolf, but also its intelligence and its enterprise. And Xenophon, albeit briefly, when he talks about Lycomedes, <coughs> he describes a character whose rise to power and then violent death is mesmerizingly similar to that of the tyrant. So Lycomedes was the dominant political figure in the Arcadian League following the Battle of Leuctra until his death at the hands of exiled Arcadians on the journey home from his negotiations with Athens. So could Plato's wolf man have been intended as a brief reflection on the character of this politician? There's further evidence, ancient as well as modern, that Plato was quite involved in the political situation at Arcadia, and two later sources report that he was invited to come as a, and, and act as a lawgiver by the Arcadians and the Thebans when they were founding Megalopolis, although he refused because he felt that the Arcadians didn't actually want to have equality. So to come to a conclusion, in making this final suggestion, um, this paper isn't attempting to identify the precise circumstances to which the analogy refers, but rather to indicate the possibilities for interpretation that are created by attempting to set Plato's brief mention of this myth of the flesh-eating werewolf in a historical context. As a historical text... It can offer scholars a prism for viewing a society and its cultural imaginary, hold it one way, and it reveals a legacy of folklore, another way, and it offers insights into the relationship between man, animal, and the gods, yet one more way may allow a glimpse of current political concerns. I've argued that Plato uses this analogy for two reasons. First, because he was concerned with the general lessons to be learned from the myth that the analogy reminds us of. Uh, which illustrated the power and responsibilities of leadership. But beyond that, I also want to argue that this werewolf may have been intended as a reflection on one Arcadian politician in particular. That's it. Do you have some questions? Um, very interesting, I think, an analogy with, you mentioned cannibalism, yeah. barbaric, but also human sacrifice. And I'm thinking of the Agamemnon and the Iphigenia of Nine because that's the, the lessons from that is in the sense of training of revenge and violence and counter-killing and yes. revenge. And it kind of like the whole thing about the destruction of human 
night, and that's why I think it goes down to the Romans who backed in the sacrifice and Britain with the Celts and yeah. the Druids. So it's kind of like it's all linked to that. We're more cultural, we don't need to sacrifice people. Yes. I mean, your analysis of that is the link between your story of Ralph um, McHale and, and, and this, but what do you think? Yes, I mean, I'd certainly um, myths, there are, there are a, a number of Greek myths in which some kind of human sacrifice occurs. And it's often the sacrifice, if you like, of a child. Um, uh, so uh, you can think about Pelops uh, sacrificing his sons again, that's sort of to test the gods. Um, you can think about um, uh, the house of Atreus and the sacrifices that go on between those two brothers. Uh, so it really is, it's, it's it's the ultimate in a form of hubristic behaviour, absolutely. Uh, and it takes someone far beyond the bounds of what it is that they should do. Uh, and it really is about challenging that boundary, about what it means to be human. And it's often great leaders who are doing this. Um, I mean, you can think about... I, I think Medea is a different case. So um, there's a woman who's <coughs> killing the children, but she's not killing them in order to eat them. It's not got that sort of sense to it. It's, that, it's a very different form of, of killing of children. But again, it's that emotional edge that she's walking along. And it's not seen the sacrifice. No, it's absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you. Great. But, so, yeah. just following on from that, the, the fact that there are several stories yes. about uh, human sacrifice in, in Greek mythology does sort of suggest that the thing is not unimaginable. No. No, I think that's right. it, could, it could have happened. There could be people who would do that. Yes, I think that's right. And in fact, Jessica Paper showed us that yeah. there are very particular kinds of people who do it. But they're all on the edges of civilization. And what's interesting about these stories, I think, is it brings you right into the Greek heart. Yeah. So at that point, you're saying, so where are they? What are they marginal in, if you see what I mean? They're obviously walking this line. But what is it? Um, and, and, and why is it... it Again, it's, it's leaders who have reached a certain point, I think, with a lot of these stories. Um, yeah, who are claiming too much. Um, but yes, not unimaginable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. But your opening phrase about the one, the one who tastes a human turns into a wolf, yeah. I mean, it implies that this idea of t tasting the human is an act of the wild. And that uh, the, and the, the one who tastes a human turns into a wolf. Also, is is it the allegory for the for the tyrant? Yes, absolutely. So, in fact, the tyrant is the wild coming into, you know, the domesticated world. Yes. And there's something, therefore, about the nature of the wild and the domesticated. Yeah. And also the nature of the wild in relationship to power. Yes. That you've somehow got to have that wild in order to have power. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. As a stranger king kind yes. of argument. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. There, 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 is, a, there is an ambiguity um, about to what extent you have to be beyond ordinary to be able to lead. Yes. Yes, I think that's right. And and being ordinary is just being domesticated, and, yeah. that's, and that's dull yeah. in some sense. Yes, there is something fascinating and attractive um, and powerful. Um, and when you go further into the Republic and uh, the myth of Earth, when he's talking about what happens to souls afterwards. What's quite interesting is where some of the souls of the wicked go, and they go into the wild, they go into the wild animals. Um, and you also have uh, the man who doesn't listen, who rushes into the soul of the tyrant and doesn't realize that it looks so nice to begin with. And he decides he's going to have this life and he rushes into it. Um, and he's going to end up uh, somehow uh, uh, killing his own children. Um, and, and there is this idea with that that um, these courses of life, if you're not going to be boring, if you're not, if you're going to be somehow, <coughs> not, it reinforces it. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Yeah. I wonder at what point Donald Trump is going to start talking about cannibalism. <laughs> 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 uh, and what if he will be from one day to the next? <laughs> 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 is it not all right? Yeah. 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 Just uh, want to share a comment about that uh, games. In uh, the athlete Dam uh, Damarcos from Parisia, winner of the Olympic Games in 400 BC in boxing, mentioned by the, the Pliny the Elder, sorry, uh, the historic Pl Pliny the Elder, as a werewolf, as he tasted the sacrificed meat from the altar of the Lycia Mountain. So Pliny the Elder also confirms that uh, meat. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, and there is another reference, I think, in Pausanias to Dinitis, and some people think the two are the same. Um, yes, uh, there is clearly some kind of ritual going on. Um, but I, I find it very difficult to believe that it involves actual human flesh, even despite um, the, there's recently been found a, a body, finally, a, finally, a body, a piece of human, a human evidence for human, um, some form of human death related ritual on the mountain. Um, and people have rushed to say, oh, this is confirmation of the ritual. And, and of course, it's not um, yet. Uh, there is no evidence that this body was the flesh on it was in any way consumed before this body was buried. So it could just be a priest. But yeah. On the other hand, tasting the entrails is a normal feature of the yes. sacrifice. That's what you'd expect. Of yeah. Even part of the uh, festivities around Easter in Greece today. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. Um, and, and again, it's pushing it just that little bit further to make it more appealing, more dangerous, more what is it that's being talked about here. And we, I mean, we simply don't know. Um, but I mean, really what I want to emphasize is that the fragments that we have are not in fact evidence for a ritual in the way that we made that connection so many years ago. All right, well, thank you very much. We move on to our next speaker. Thank you.